Are we on? Um, good morning, good, good afternoon. Um, my name is John Skibiak. I'm the director of the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition, and I'd like to, to welcome everyone uh, on this call to uh, this webinar on the uh, CHI RHSC Family Planning Market Report. Um, I'm joined this morning by, by four colleagues um join not physically i think we're calling from all around the world um but with me uh will be uh martin smith from fp 2020 um marie chantal lapine from from chai um and we also have vanessa hung from chai uh who will be walking us through uh the report uh, and, and the findings of, of the report. Um, this report that we'll be reviewing this morning um, is, is actually the fifth uh, edition uh, of the, the market report. And, and really over the course of, of the last five years, we've, we've really seen this report become a, a critical component um, in the, the toolbox that we have for really understanding the, the evolving reproductive health uh, and family planning supplies landscape. Um, each of the tools in that box, uh, be it the gap, costed gap analysis, um, the RHI, recent ecosystem report, each sort of look at the landscape from a slightly different perspective with different data sets, look at different uh, groupings of countries, but together they they help us form uh, a more accurate sense of current market trends uh, and what we as a as a community need to be doing uh, over the course of 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 the coming years and and, and particularly as we're entering the the new post 2020 um, decade. Um, I'll leave it to to Vanessa to to provide the details um, of of the report. Uh, but needless to say, I'm 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 happy as I I read it to see that there's really a lot of alignment uh, between the data that's emerging from from this report uh, and much of the work that that we've been uh, producing within the the context of the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, happy to see uh, the references and the acknowledgement of the shifting uh, financial contributions to the supplies landscape, and, and particularly uh, uncertainty over the relative contribution of of, of donor funding uh, to reproductive health uh, supply needs uh, looking looking forward. And I think the the results of of this analysis. Um, uh, makes that clear. Um, but I think this also, one of the things that I found really interesting about this report um, is that it also showed really the, um, the important contextual role of, of, of countries um, in determining many of the, many of the patterns that, that we see here. Um, donor support may be declining uh, but for those countries that depend on donor support now, and I think in our gap analysis, cost of gap analysis, um, we identify those countries as, as the low income countries, donors play an absolutely indispensable role. And those countries remain uh, highly dependent on donor support and will likely do so uh, for much of the coming decade. And so, although you know, we talk a lot about the growing role of domestic resource mobilization and, and out-of-pocket expenditures. Uh, that doesn't diminish the critical role played by the donor community. And I think this report uh, makes that very clear in its, in its analysis. So I, I really would like to congratulate the authors of the report in, in doing that. Um, I think the report also uh, reaffirms one of the, the key findings of the the cost of gap analysis. Uh, the trends are often country specific. We like to think of, 
of the world as a large grouping, whether it's 69 FP2020 countries or the 135 low middle income countries, but really uh, the data that we see often depends in large part on certain subgroupings of countries and often individual countries. Um, and I think this comes through very clearly in the report as well when we see that the, the 10 largest markets, for example, account for over 50% um, of, the, um, of the, the total market. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I think we have really um, a, an interesting discussion ahead of us, and I'd like to, to, to move on um, just so that people are, are uh, aware of, of the way this call will be uh, structured. Uh, all of us are hearing this call right now through the GoToWebinar platform, which has a cap. Uh, of about 100 people. I, I, I hear from my colleagues, we have about 56 participants on this call right now, so it doesn't look as though we're going to uh, need to move over to another platform to take the, the, um, the, the spillover. I think we had something like 150 people registered for the call, so we were preparing for that. Uh, should we, over the course of the next few minutes, discover that there is a huge upsurge in, in numbers, we will send a message out to um, uh, send a message out to everyone who's registered for the call, letting them know where to go to, to, to join in. Um, during the course of, of the webinar, uh, please feel free to enter your, your questions in the, in the question box at the bottom of the screen. Um, everyone will be muted except, of course, a speaker. So this is the opportunity uh, to ask questions throughout. Uh, and then at the end of the session, we will go through those questions uh, to the extent that, that we can. Um, it's probably unlikely uh, that we will be able to get through all of the questions, um, in which case what we will do uh, is we will prepare written responses to the questions. Uh, which will get sent out to everyone uh, when when you get a copy of the webinar um, itself. Uh, and these will be made available uh, both as they go out and also on on our website and, and others as well. Um, I think that really uh, encompasses most of what I wanted to say this morning. And so um, it's my pleasure to to turn the floor over to Martin. Thanks very much indeed, John, uh, to RHSC, to our colleagues at CHAI uh, for the excellent critical uh, annual analysis that's contained within the, uh, the FP market uh, report and um, appreciate the opportunity for me to just give you three quick slides, three quick uh, elements from uh, FP 2020's perspective, some context in terms of the progress that's being made in the 69 countries. Uh, that you see on the screen right now. Then I'll pivot to talking about financing specifically, some numbers around many of the, the key points that John was just making around donor and domestic uh, financing. And then thirdly, I'll briefly touch on, on the post-2020 FP movement. We'll have more on that in our q and I'm sure. So here on the slide, we have uh, summary data from FP 2020's annual progress report from November of 2019. Uh, from our data at the midpoint of, uh, of 2019, there were 53 million additional users of modern contraceptives in the 69 FP 2020 focus countries compared to our baseline in July of 2012. That's 9 million more women and adolescent girls using a modern method compared to a year previously in July of 2018. Of course, this is short of the pace that's needed to reach the ambitious 120 million additional users by 2020, but there are significant signs of progress across many countries and many of the indicators, and the 120 million goal remains still a critical benchmark that we will achieve on the path to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals uh, by 2030. Of course, this growth in additional users happens due to population growth within the 69 FP 2020 countries and increases in contraceptive prevalence rates and we're happy to report that nine countries are on track to achieve their MCPR goals that they established 
in 2012, and another 13 of those countries are within a couple or uh, five percentage points uh, from achieving their goals. So with a bit more acceleration, several are within range of achieving them. In terms of method mix, uh, we see 32 countries, 32 of the 69 countries in plants have assumed a substantially greater proportion of modern use uh, across the last seven years, particularly in the last year. And injectables have grown as a proportion of the method mix in 13 countries, with significant increases seen in self-injection in several FP2020 countries. And as I move from my first slide to my second slide, uh, I'm just going to talk about this 1.5 billion dollars that you see and what this represents. So, in terms of uh, bilateral uh, funding for family planning, we really had a watershed mark in terms of growth in bilateral disbursements in the year 2018. 1.5 billion dollars was dispersed, and as you can see from the graph here, this was the highest level uh, since the London summit in 2012. And seven donors increased their funding in the fiscal year 2018, those donors being Canada, Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, the UK, and the US. And while the rise in funding from the United States is largely due to the timing of disbursements, because as I think we all know, allocations for family planning from the US have remained essentially flat um, of recent years, the other increases uh, from the other donors do reflect the impact in many ways of the 2017 Family Planning Summit and the renewed commitments from several donors. Moving swiftly from the continued importance of, of donor financing, and uh, I'm just going to say one other thing about financing um, before I get to this post-2020 slide. Apologies for, for, for that. And that is the, the importance of donor financing, of course, but as John said, the continued importance of an emphasis on domestic financing for family planning. And our visibility around domestic expenditures uh, is improving. We published for 31 countries in November 2018, we published domestic expenditure data for 37 countries in a report of November 2019, and we're having significantly increased visibility, I think, on expenditures overall. We can report that 18 of the 41 countries that had made domestic financing commitments to FP2020 and who reported are on, on track to achieve uh, those commitments, while the further 17 have work still to do and six um, have yet to report. And now we can move to my final slide, and I hope I'm, I'm keeping to time. Um, and this is about the, uh, the post-2020 family planning movement. So extensive feedback from, from you, from our community, was used to refine the vision, the focus areas, and the guiding principles during the course of last year, 2019. And I hope you can see yourselves and your contributions in this vision framework, the vision working together for a future where all women and adolescent girls everywhere have the freedom and ability to make their own informed decisions about using modern contraception and whether, when, and how many children to have, lead healthy lives, and participate as equals in society and its development. So we have our, our vision framework now, and the business of 2020 is going to be about operationalizing that vision framework, the architecture that's needed to support the achievement of that vision. I look forward to a bit more engagement with you uh, during the Q&A session at the end of this webinar, uh, particularly on, on post-2020. And with that, I believe that was five minutes, uh, and I would uh, now very much like to introduce Mary Chantel, Special Advisor at CHAI, to take us through the next section of our webinar. Over to you, Mary Chantel. Thank you very much, Martin. We are celebrating the fifth anniversary of the publication of uh, the market report this year. So we're very, very proud to be part of such a, a unique initiative as I work across other areas. I can tell you, I've not seen another such example of data exchange and collaboration with manufacturers, manufacturers and stakeholders alike. This is truly unique in this large space and, and we have that. I want to thank, obviously, our donors for continuing to support. Manufacturers who are putting your trust in us and sharing your data so easily. We take good care care and measures to protect the confidentiality of your data. We take this very, very seriously. Without you, this quality would not be possible. We thank again the donors and manufacturers, as well as procurers, and all other stakeholders who many of whom have been uh, listening to this webinar this morning 
um, your input, your feedback, your producers that make uh, what it is and how you Pardon me, I'm not sure if this is happening yeah. for anyone else, but Marie Chantel, you're breaking up a little bit. Is it possible for you to move closer to the mic? Yes. Does that it's work? Much it's much, much clearer. Better. Okay. And to our HSC, our partner, we thank you for your continued support and really your contributions to the publication of the report. We also are pleased to acknowledge that we continue to increase our coverage and visibility with new manufacturers joining us in this initiative. 15 suppliers are now represented in this report. We started with seven five years ago. Our aim is to further enhance visibility by continuing to Marie Chantal, you're you're still breaking up. It's um, okay. Now it's. I'm going to change the spot. Okay. Okay, I don't hear anything at all right now. Um, Marie Chantal, are you back? Um, um, maybe in the meantime, uh, this is Vanessa. Um, I can re-summarize some of the points that um, we might have missed when she got cut off. That might be a good idea. Um, yeah. So. Just want to start off by saying um, that we greatly want to um, thank hi. the suppliers who have. Hello, everyone. Oh, hi, I'm MC. Sorry. I apologize for that. I'm trying to move from one section to the other of where I am at a meeting. And as you all know, we're trying to must to tax. So apologies. Thank you, Vanessa, for. Um, um, you know, you're jumping in here. I just wanted to really basically thank everyone for your continued support and contributions to this report. Certainly, without all of your feedback input uh, pushing us, you know, this analysis would not be what it is. Um, I think, you know, we, many of us at least on this webinar, um, would like to further understand how. Um, the private sector and how commodities are sourced better or sourced or subsidized better in the coming years. And our commitment to you is that we will work alongside RHSC and a multitude of other stakeholders to try to get deeper uh, with our understanding of, of that sector. I think it's important we've all either from you know, afar or directly been involved with a number of product introductions over the last years. And that sector continues to be something where it would, I think, be very beneficial to dig deeper. And so um, thank you again. Um, I wanna make sure that we leave enough time for uh, Vanessa to run through the slides. So I will turn everything over to her now. And again, I apologize profusely for my technological issues this morning. Thank you very much, Marie Chantel, and thank you, John and Martin, for your introductions and opening remarks. So I'm going to start off by giving an overview of the Global Markets Visibility Project. So as part of this project, the Family Planning Market Report uses supplier shipment data to provide a comprehensive look into the FP2020 
public and social sector family planning procurement market. Each year, suppliers provide confidential shipment data to try. We aggregate this data as part of our agreements with suppliers, and then we analyze it to produce the output seen in the market report. This year, we've added one new supplier to the project for a total of 15 participating suppliers. You can see the list of suppliers under the participation section of the slide. And the supplier base represents the majority of suppliers supported by donors. As John and uh, Marie Chantel mentioned, this year marks the report's fifth year iteration. And since its first iteration in 2015, the report has been used as an important decision-making tool for the family planning community. It has since been a key resource for donors, suppliers, countries, and implementing partners to make procurement decisions and strategic investments. Now, I'll note what's new in this year's report, as well as give an overview of the report's sections. This year's report features 2018 supplier shipment data. It also includes data from one new supplier. And finally, this report focuses on the latest five-year trend. In terms of the report structure, the report is composed of three sections. And the data sources for each section are highlighted in the slide. The first and main body of analyses is the supplier shipment analysis. And this draws on confidential supplier shipment data, which we aggregate. The second section consists of the donor spend analysis, and this is based on data from USAID and UNFPA, the two largest institutional procurers of family planning commodities. For USAID, we took data directly from the USAID contraceptives and condoms shipment report, a publicly available data source. For UNFPA, we get the data directly from its procurement branch. And the last section of the report includes a discussion of key trends and themes from CHI's discussions with a number of suppliers, donors, and partners. Now I am going to go over the FP 2020 public sector contraceptive market trends. This slide goes over the report's coverage and scope. The scope of the market report covers the 69 FP 2020 countries in the public sector only. For the report, we define public sector as Ministry of Health and Government, as well as institutional buyers, including UNFPA, USAID, and SMOs. We do not include the commercial sector. Regarding the social sector, I want to note that our market report counts the social sector, such as SMOs, as institutional procurement that is part of the public sector. And I want to make this distinction because the social sector is sometimes counted as the private sector in other forums since it may involve out-of-pocket fees. This report focuses on product-based modern methods only. So the table in this slide shows the aggregated volumes by method from 2014 to 2018 to the 69 FP 2020 countries that are reflected in our report. Volumes are from supplier shipment data, with the exception of the male condoms category, where volumes were taken from RHI due to a higher fragmentation of the market for male condoms. It is important to note that in almost every year and every method, cumulative volumes from 2014 to 2018 from our supplier reported shipment volumes are greater than RHI. Now, I will go into the main trends from the 2018 supplier shipment data. This slide shows the market value of contraceptives shipped to the FP 2020 public sector market. <clears throat> We calculated market value by multiplying shipment volumes from suppliers 
by prices from the UNFPA contraceptive price indicator. Overall, market value decreased from 293 million in 2014 to 226 million in 2018, representing a compounded annual growth rate of negative 6%. When we look at which methods drove this decline, from 2014 to 2018, the decline in market value was largely driven by a decrease in volumes of orals combined in progestin only, which you can see in the gray bar, and injectables, which you can see um, in the dark blue bar. Now this slide looks at the market from a couple years of protection or CYP's shift lens. In our report, we calculate CYP's by dividing shipments by their corresponding CYP factor. From 2014 to 2018, CYP's shift remained fairly level with the exception of a notable decrease from 2015 to 2016. Driven by injectables shown in the dark blue bar, and again decreasing from 2016 to 2017, driven by IUDs, which you can see in the orange bars. 2018 saw a reversal of this decline, driven by an increase in IUDs, shown in orange here, and to a lesser extent, injectables, shown here in dark blue, and implants, which are shown in yellow. If we look at the five-year trend from 2014 to 2018, there was a slight decline in CYP's shift from 2014 to 2018, driven by a decline in shipments of orals combined in progestin only, shown in the light gray bar, as well as the decline in injectables, shown in the dark blue bar. Orals combined in progestin only shown in the light gray bar, declined by 22% annually from 2014 to 2018, while injectables in the dark blue bar declined by 9% annually from 2014 to 2018. These decreases were offset by an increase in CYP's shift of implants, which you can see in yellow. Implants grew at a compounded annual growth rate of 12%. From 2014 to 2018. Here we take a look at CYP mix, which refers to the percentage distribution of CYPs shipped by method. We see that in 2018, long acting reversible contraceptives, or LARCs, which in our report includes IUDs and implants still make up a larger proportion of the CYP mix compared to short-acting methods, which in our report consist of orals, male and female condoms, and injectables. In 2018, long-acting methods made up 67% of the CYP mix. This is a continuation of the trend of a shift towards longer-acting methods. Since 2014, LARC's percentage of the CYP mix has increased. In 2014, LARC's made up 53% of the CYP mix. From 2016 to 2018, LARC's made up an average of 66% of the CYP mix. Now this graph illustrates how from 2017 to 2018, market value saw a relatively smaller increase compared to the large increase in CYP's ship. In earlier slides, we saw that the most pronounced trend in CYP's shift in 2018 was a significant increase in CYP's shift of IUDs. IUDs are by far the most cost-effective method covered in this report at a cost per CYP of $0.07 cents in 2018. As a result, an increase in IUD volumes has a larger impact on the FP2020 public sector market in terms of CYP's shift, but a relatively lesser impact on the market in terms of value. 
we can see in this graph that even though CYPs shipped for the IUDs method increased significantly from 2017 to 2018, the market value for IUDs increased by a relatively lower amount. The next two slides look at the donor spend analysis portion of the report, and specifically trends from UNFPA and USAID, the two largest institutional procurers of FP commodities. As we did in our supplier shipment data analyses, we focus on trends from the five-year period from 2014 to 2018. Now, I want to note here that the data sources we used for this donor, sp donor spend analysis are not directly comparable to the supplier shipment data due to factors such as differences in timing and, for instance, the exclusion of male and female condoms for USA in the spend data. The graph on this slide looks at USAID's contraceptive shipment values to FP 2020 countries using data from USAID's overview of contraceptives and condom shipments report. From 2017 to 2018, USAID spend to FP 2020 countries increased significantly at a fiscal 2017 to fiscal 2018 growth rate of 46%. This increase was largely driven by increased shipments of implants, injectables, and IUDs. As cited in USAID's overview of contraceptives and condom shipments, fiscal year 2018 report, the fiscal year 2017 to fiscal year 2018 increase in value was potentially due to a resumption of more regular ordering patterns after a fiscal year 2017 dip in implants, injectables, and IUDs. Now, if we look at the trend in spend over the past five years from fiscal year 2014 to fiscal year 2018, we see that USAID's spend to the FP 2020 countries in the past three years, from fiscal years 2016 to 2018, has been lower relative to spend in fiscal years 2014 and 2015. If we look at fiscal year 2015, spend increased from 58 million to 73 million. In comparison, spend from fiscal years 2016 to 2018 have been relatively lower than spend in fiscal years 2014 and 2015. Average spend from fiscal years 2016 to 2018 was 43 million. This slide looks at UNFPA procurement values. We received data directly from UNFPA's procurement services branch. UNFPA's procurement value in 2018 represents a five-year high. The 2018 increase in procurement value was driven by three factors. First, there was an increase in funds allocated by UNFPA for procurement of commodities. Second, an increase in third-party procurement played a role. And finally, rapid fund mobilization initiatives from UNFPA country offices to support procurement of commodities contributed to the increase in UNFPA procurement value seen in 2018. If we shift our attention to the five-year trend from 2014 to 2018, we can note that the value of contraceptives procured increased by 8% annually from 2014 to 2018. The procurement value remained relatively flat from 2014 to 2015, decreased in 2016, and it increased by about 25% in 2017, before increasing again by 51% in 2018. You'll notice that despite the fact that supplier shipment data is not directly comparable to our data sources for USAID and UNFPA spend, both USAID and UNFPA increased their spending on family planning products in 2018. And this is consistent with what we have seen this year in the supplier shipment data. Now, um, I'm going to share some key observations on these trends. The 
This slide looks at discussion points and themes raised from CHI's consultations with suppliers, donors, and partners. Stakeholders express relief at the increase in market value from 2017 to 2018. And they were also pleased at the increase in donor spend from 2017 to 2018, as a number of stakeholders had expressed concern last year over the decrease in donor spend in recent years. However, some stakeholders expressed concern that the market value had not yet returned to pre-2016 levels. Others noted the uncertainty of long-term future donor spend. Second, stakeholders suggested explanations for observed trends in the IUDs category, which saw notable changes in both 2017 and 2018. You may recall that 2017 marked a five-year low for CYPs shipped to FP 2020 markets, driven by a decline in IUDs. In contrast, in 2018, there was a significant increase in CYPs shipped, also driven by IUDs. In our supplier shipment analyses, we observed that Egypt was the top country driving the IUD shipment volume decline in 2017. And it was also the top country driving the increase in IUDs shipped in 2018. Stakeholders suggested that the increase in IUDs shipped in 2018 was a reversal of the significant drop in IUD shipments in 2017, driven by procurement fluctuations inherent in supplier shipment data. It's important for us to note that while there was a significant increase in IUDs shipped in 2018, after 2017's low, 2018 volumes were in line with 2014 to 2016 volumes. And finally, more generally, stakeholders commented on the nature of supplier shipment data impacting year-to-year -year trends. I want to note here that trends in procurement are impacted by a number of factors other than consumption. These include factors such as manufacturing lead times, inventory holding policies, or views on wastage of supplies. The timing of when orders are placed versus when they are shipped can also play a role. For instance, suppliers provide us annual volumes data that is recorded at shipment date, which differs in timing from when those orders were placed. Due to factors such as manufacturing lead times, an order may be placed in one year and shipped in the next year. These operational considerations would affect the shipment data, but do not necessarily reflect changes in consumption or programmatic changes. So that brings us to the end of the presentation part of the webinar. You can read the report at the link and we urge suppliers interested in participating in this project to contact myself or my colleague. Eleni using the contact information listed here. Now we'll begin the question and answer period of our webinar. We will give a few minutes um, for people to send in questions via the chat box. And if we aren't able to address all the questions that we receive before the end of this webinar at 11 a.m. EST, um, then we will address your questions either via email or uh, posting a document later on. And if you have additional questions that you weren't able to ask within the duration of this webinar, again, please email them to um, me or my colleague Eleni at the emails posted above. So thank you very much, and we'll open up the Q&A period. Great, thank you, Vanessa. <clears throat> um, for the questions, are are you or Eleni going to uh, read out the questions? Right. So once we start receiving questions, I will read out the okay. question and I will redirect um, to one of our speakers to answer or answer the question myself. But yes, I will be reading them out loud. Okay. Oh, you 
Okay, so the first question we have received is, now that we've entered 2020, what are plans for post 2020? And I think Martin, you're well placed to answer this question if you could chime in here. Thanks uh, very much indeed, uh, Vanessa. Uh, great question. So uh, as I set out in, in the third and final slide at the beginning um, of the webinar, uh, we have the 2030 vision framework uh, very much in place. That's uh, uh, on the basis of uh, well over a thousand different contributions and interactions that happened during 2019. And that final vision framework, which you can see on the familyplanning2020.org forward slash beyond 2020, that vision framework is going to be finalized in the next couple of weeks uh, in terms of the, the vision statement, uh, the focus areas, there are five of them, of course, and the uh, guiding principles. So with that, that, uh, that vision uh, clear, um, you might say, then form follows function. Uh, and so the business Part of the business of, um, of 2020 is going to be uh, articulating the architecture uh, that will uh, support the achievement of that, uh, that vision, that country-led vision. So expect a lot more from us, uh, from the core conveners of FP2020, uh, USA, and FPA, the Gates Foundation and the UK Department for International Development. Expect more from the FP2020 reference group. Uh, on uh, the architecture that will uh, will um, help us to fulfil that vision. Uh, lots more on that in the coming months. Lots more also in terms of what the commitment process will look like uh, for the next uh, family planning movement. Here we've got ICFP on the horizon in February of 2021, which is a very good uh, a very good point in all of our minds. Uh, early in the early in the new decade, uh, if you like, so there'll be much more clarity on the commitment process. Uh, that will run through uh, the coming months uh, to take us into the next uh, the next decade. So uh, a lot more detail to come, uh, a significant amount of communication from us, but also we want to hear from you further, hear how you see yourselves in the vision framework and its achievement, uh, hear your views on the five focus areas, many of which uh, speak to the expertise of those people we have on the line here in terms of financing, in terms of data driving decision making, in terms of improving the system responsiveness to the individual rights and needs of women and girls uh, across the um, across the focus countries. So lots more to come uh, and please do uh, arrange calls with us, give us your feedback and, and engage with us very closely. Finally, uh, the FP2020 Secretariat uh, isn't going anywhere. Uh, we don't finish on the 31st of December of 2020. Uh, we're funded through to March of 2022 and fully committed to a, a, a transition which really stands up the new architecture for the new FP movement uh, to, uh, to achieve that ambitious vision that we set out earlier on. So I hope that gives you enough for the time being and, and allows us to pivot to a few other questions. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you very much, Martin. We actually had a bit of a follow-up question um, for your remarks on the post-2020. Um, so that is um, also what is the timeline for post-2020 vision and structure being finalized? Yeah, so the, the vision framework um, is, is almost final, quite frankly, and within the next couple of weeks, uh, that vision framework you can see on the Beyond 2020 site will be refinalized, will be recrystallized, if you like. But the, the time frames through the next 12 months are, um, you know, we know the goals that we need to achieve in terms of of architecture uh, and in terms of setting up the commitment process. Um, but beyond that, uh, the, the detailed milestones within that 12 months, I'd, I'd like to just uh, ask for a little bit more, bit more time, bit of forbearance from all of you. Um, there'll be a great deal more clarity on that, uh, particularly in the second quarter of this year from April to June, that will allow everyone to understand architecture and commitment making and so forth. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. And also there's one more question directed for you. Um, the question is, Martin mentioned that donors had invested $1.5 billion over how many years? Yeah, great question. So that's an annual figure. And I'm sorry if my, uh, my presentation didn't make that clear. That is, uh, that is the fiscal year for our bilateral donors of 2018. And you would have seen in that graph 
the second slide that I presented, which took us through from 2012 to 2018, uh, the trend line, and you can see those are all annual figures. So that 1.5 billion is the highest. Uh, the second highest was 1.43 billion back in 2014. And you can see all of that information in detail on our website, uh, as well as a significant amount of analysis from our colleagues at the Kaiser Family Foundation uh, on the uh, donor trends that lie within that 1.5 billion annualized figure for 2018. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. So we have another question here. To what extent are changes in market value attributed to changes in commodity prices? Thank you for this question, and it's an important point. So the prices we use to calculate the market value in our market report, um, we get from the contraceptive price indicator, which is published by UNFPA, and which is a publicly available resource that shows uh, prices of UNFPA procurement. The reason that we do it in this way is to use a standardized pricing to calculate the market value. And when we look at the pricing over the 2014 to 2018 period from UNFPA, the degree of fluctuation within each method has been minimal. And as such, the changes in the value of the market over the 2014 to 2018 period, we can attribute mostly to fluctuations in shipment volumes. And you can actually reference this in the appendix of our report, uh, where we've listed commodity prices used for our market value calculation. So our next question, I think, John, it would be great if you could chime in here, um, is will supplier shipment data be part of the global family planning van? <laughs> sure. Um, the, the data that's collected uh, through the, the market report uh, in many ways is very similar to the kinds of data uh, that is being collected uh, for the van, uh, largely shipment data uh, from from manufacturers, um, and 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 certainly uh, the data uh, could be a valuable contribution to the van. Um, the reality, though, uh, is that the the data that's received by Chai uh, as as part of the the, the report. Um, is also protected through confidentiality agreements with with manufacturers. So there really isn't the prospect for um, that data feeding directly into the van. Uh, but as the van grows and there are more and more manufacturers uh, and others uh, feeding data into the van, um, it certainly uh, stands to reason that the van itself will become the vehicle and the data collection uh, conduit for reports such as this, so that the need to maintain these ongoing one-on-one -on -one relationships and the confidential confidentiality agreements with each of those manufacturers will no longer be necessary. Uh, so that is a longer uh, a longer time frame. Uh, there are, as I mentioned, certainly many more manufacturers contributing data to the market report than there are to the van right now. Uh, but certainly uh, it is a realistic prospect uh, that we could see the van becoming the data source for, for this moving forward. Thank you, John. Um, the next question we have is, thanks very much for a very clear presentation. Has there been any discussion or interest in potentially including manufacturer data on their commercial market in these countries in future reports? So it's a very good question, and there has certainly been a lot of interest in the community um, surrounding the private sector for family planning commodities. While we know there have been many efforts in the community to estimate the private sector, from a supplier shipment and procurement standpoint, which is what our supplier shipment data shows us, we have limited visibility on this. So as a community, 
going forward, we recognize that it will be very important for us to work to obtain this visibility as we know countries are transitioning towards other sources of funding. And perhaps, John, um, if you'd like to chime in on CGA projections surrounding the private sector or efforts for visibility there. Sure, sure. I mean, I think there, there are a number of ways of, um, of addressing this issue. And I, and I think there's, you know, on the one side, there's kind of the data availability side, <clears throat> and there's also kind of the future for out-of-pocket expenditures. Um, I mean, in terms of data uh, availability, private out-of-pocket expenditures is, is largely driven by, by pills. And there are a wide range of, of manufacturers and suppliers. So it's kind of difficult to, to track that um, in the same way the data uh, is being collected uh, for this. So there is a, a challenge inherent in that. And you know, some countries simply have more information uh, available in the private market than, than others. And there are companies out there that collect that information, uh, IQVIA, uh, Nielsen, and, and, and many are in our community are engaging with partners in that space to get um, uh, better, better visibility into, into the data. Um, I mean, in terms of the future of out-of-pocket out expenditures, I mean, I think that will it will depend on a, a number of factors. Uh, market forces obviously being one, but I think there are also, you know, policy decisions at country level uh, that will determine uh, to what degree out-of-pocket expenditures comprise larger and larger uh, proportions of, of spending on on um, on commodities. If you if you look at, and I think I mentioned this earlier on, the the gap analysis. Uh, what it did is it showed uh, increase in in, in out-of-pocket expenditures, uh, but again, it was basing that really on on trend lines. Uh, it's not basing it on uh, an analysis of policy projections or whatever that we anticipate taking place in countries. So it really could um, it could vary. But I, I you know I think. By and large, the feeling within the community, based on the data that we see here and and others, is that you know the relative contribution of donors, particularly in light of growing demand for contraceptives overall, um, will probably decline uh, relative to the whole, and we will see increases in out-of-pocket expenditures. And you know, ideally, I think we will also see increases in domestic resource mobilization. Uh, donors right now tend to be funding largely public sector programs. Uh, and the only way that public sector option will continue is if domestic resources are, are funding it. So, you know, I think that will play a, a key role in, in the overall mix moving forward. Thank you very much, John. We have another question here. Um, that seems to be a follow-up question from when Martin mentioned that donors had invested $1.5 billion. So the question is, why the gap then among donor investment and market value? Uh, thank you very much for this question. And just to take a step back here, um, it's important to, I guess, note that the market report and the supplier shipment data that we present um, are a critical tool, as John mentioned, in a toolbox of other data points and reports. So the donor investment figures shared by Martin are very important for contextualizing this conversation. Um, and when we compare data sources, we see that the messages that arise are that trends are very similar. Um, however, the data that Martin shared is not directly comparable to the market value that we show in this report due to differences in scope, uh, data sources, and methodology. 
So for example, the donor investment figures shared by Martin cover family planning spending beyond family planning commodities, whereas the focus of our supplier uh, shipment data and our donor spend data for the market report um, is on commodities, family planning commodities only. We have one more question before uh, we wrap up. Can you provide a brief overview of the methodology for this report? Yes, um, thank you for this question. So in terms of methodology, we collect confidential supplier shipment data on an annual basis from our suppliers. And we include shipment volumes to FP 2020 countries only when we analyze the data, as well as shipments to non-FP 2020 countries where we can reasonably assume that the final destination for those shipments is in FP 2020 countries. And we validate this assumption with suppliers. To get to market value, we take the volumes and multiply them by prices that we get from UNFPA's publicly available contraceptive price indicator. And for CYPs shipped, we divide those volumes by corresponding CYP factors. So I think that's time for this market report webinar so we can wrap up. There may have been questions that we didn't get to address within the duration of this webinar and we can follow up afterwards uh, to address those questions either via email or by posting the answers um, on the RHSB website. So I want to thank um, RHSC for partnering with us for this report, as well as the suppliers and stakeholders um, for partnering as well. And thank you very much to our speakers, um, MC John Martin and Eleni as well. Thank you. Thank you. Very thank much. you so much, everyone. Thank you.